Welcome, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, to evidence and video clips that will shock you. By the time you have finished watching all the material on this tape, you will know certain things about the movement that is known as the Toronto Blessing and about those ministering it that not many people know about. You will be witnessing footage of popular and well-known preachers who have positions of leadership in the Christian church that will shock many of you, especially those of you who admire and follow these leaders. You will see the real and dark side of men like Rodney Howard Brown, Kenneth Copeland, Mike Evans, Jesse Duplantis and others that not many people know about. A side that clearly shows these men to be in league with Satan. If you have experienced the Toronto blessing, may I appeal to you as your brother in Christ that you will allow me the opportunity to share all these things with you by watching the video right till the very end. If you do this, you will not only seriously consider and question the source of your experiences, but you will also be led by the Holy Spirit to renounce all of your involvement and contact with the movement. There is really no other action than a genuine Christian who is honestly seeking to know the truth and has been caught up in this movement can take after watching the video clips that I'll be presenting very shortly. There is no way around the evidence. It's very important that I press this point home at the very beginning of this video as the demons will begin to, begin to get desperate and would have already begun to work on those of you who have been through the movement to fill your minds with unbelief and mockery towards what I am saying. I can tell you for sure that they won't let go of you without a struggle. I'll be endeavouring to show as many examples as I'm able to fit on this video. None of you should have any problems hearing all these things as they are easy to pick up when someone is pointing them out to you and telling you what to listen for. There is no doubt in my mind that you'll hear enough to know the truth of the spirit that is behind this movement and enough to come to the same conviction of what I have stated these men to be. So watch now the rest of this video with very careful attention as we are about to pull the Christian mask off the face of this movement and you'll see the spirit of Satanism working through these men in these meetings. uncontrollably and has been adopted by thousands of churches in Britain. The traditionalists meeting at a special conference this week say it's bringing the church into disrepute. To some, the Toronto Blessing is a peaceful, refreshing experience, deepening their faith and its spread over the past year into even mainstream churches is evidence that the Holy Spirit is at work and a full-scale Christian revival could be just around the corner. The almost animal-like sounds and actions some people have produced under the influence of the blessing here at the church where it originated in Toronto and in this country too have though provoked growing criticism that it's all distinctly unbiblical. <laughs> Let's move on now to this next section as we spend a fair bit of time on the sign of allegiance to Satan. Just be showing you examples of Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland and Jesse Duplantis doing this sign. As an introduction to this next section, let me play you a segment from the video The Rise of Satanism where Satanist Richard Ramirez could be seen doing this sign. And also a segment from the Hell's Bells video where we are given an explanation of the sign. National news coverage brought the demented crimes of self-styled Satanist and serial murder Richard Ramirez into public attention. His crimes included raping a woman in the same bed as the dead body of her husband, whom he had just killed. She then listened helplessly as Ramirez sodomized her eight-year-old son. Another woman was forced to swear allegiance to Satan as Ramirez beat and raped her, while yet another elderly lady had a pentagram carved on her thigh. 
Ramirez arrogantly brandished secret satanic symbols to the press. He flashed a two-fingered devil sign to news reporters, prominently greeted the courtroom with, Hail Satan, and conspicuously waved the pentagram drawn on his palm. You don't understand me, you are expected to. You are not capable of it. I am beyond your experience. I am beyond good and evil. I will be avenged. Lucifer dwells within us all. Another symbol that is integral to satanic religion is the El Cronado, a hand gesture that represents the devil himself. Like the pentagram, it too is virtually everywhere in rock music. Ozzy Osbourne, Meatloaf, Rick James, Cheap Trick, Motley Crue, Frankie Goes to Hollywood, Coven, The Beatles, Kiss, Todd Rundgren, and Dio are just a few examples where this sign for Satan is used. There's a very famous Christian rock performer who does the sign of allegiance to the devil in concert. We're going to take a look in a second at a video clip of her doing just that. You can find this sign on the back of the Satanic Bible by Anton LaVey. It doesn't mean I love you. It means allegiance to Satan. When the thumb and two middle fingers are turned down and the index and the pinky are turned up, it signifies the horns of the goat and that the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are in subjection to the devil and Antichrist. Jesus' physical nature, he has the traits of his mother. By watching him do that, we can know that the Holy Spirit is not controlling this man, because the Holy Spirit living inside a person would never cause that person to do this sign, unless one would dare to attribute in utter madness to the work of the Holy Spirit, the causing of a person to acknowledge Satan as Lord. Whenever a person does this with his fingers, whether in ignorance or not, you can always be sure that a demon is making him do this sign. Let's take a look at another example. Kenneth Copeland can be seen doing this sign. This clip is from one of his own programs. Watch his left hand here as he does the sign. This is the Believer's Voice of Victory broadcast. Today, Gloria Copeland, my wife, will be concluding her series on the spirit of faith. This is the Believer's Voice of Victory broadcast. Today, Gloria Copeland, my wife, will be concluding her series on the spirit of faith. Watch his right hand here and you'll see him doing the sign. I don't wait for the devil to attack me. I do know when I start doing things for God in a big way, like buying more television time, building, building, you know. Watch this one also, we can be seen doing it again. This one is very clear. Watch him as he raises his right hand and does the sign of allegiance to Satan. Let me tell you why you asked this guy for his address. He said, why? I said, you're going to bless him. He said, yeah, I'm going to send an offering. I said, me too. And we did, and it was a good offering. You know, you know what we were? hidden channels of communication. God had pre prepared that man to meet us so we could be a blessing to him to put some fruit in his life. He said, yeah, I'm going to send him an offering. I said, me too. And we did, and it was a good offering. You know, you know what we were? Hidden channels of communication. God had prepared that man to meet us so we could be a blessing to him to put some fruit in his life. Now watch Benny Hinn on this next one as he's walking around on the platform do the sign of allegiance to Satan. Go ahead, Fred. Let all the earth keep silence. Before when you enter that holy temple. Go ahead, Fred. Let all the earth keep silence. 
before when his. you enter that holy temple Somebody said, well, I don't know, is this God? You can judge it by manifestation. You can never judge revival by manifestation. I don't care if people fly through the air, do a backward somersault, and go into the floor. Now it's examples like this next one which show that these men are in no way ignorant as to the meaning of this, this sign. This is taken from Benny Hinn's program, This Is Your Day. Here we can see this lady speaking into the microphone that's in Benny Hinn's hand. Now watch this next bit very carefully. As the picture changes to another view of a camera that is filming this scene, you can see Benny Hinn's co-worker extending out his right hand, which is on the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Now watch his hand very, very carefully as he curls up the two middle fingers and leaves the two end ones extended. Watch what happens next. Benny Hinn sees this and is aware that the camera will pick this up. So he quickly grabs the microphone with his left hand and uses his right hand to slap his co-worker's hand out of the way. As if to say, don't do it so blatantly or they'll find out who we are. Watch it carefully as I play it a few times for you. That is watched over this man for this night so that God could take him home with, to be spiritually. And it's wonderful. <laughs> Pastor, he brought his nephew down to get saved. God has watched over this man for this night so that God could take him home with, to be spiritually. And it's wonderful. <laughs> Pastor, he brought his nephew down to get saved. This is the one that a lot of Christians viewing the footage have already picked up. On this one you can see Kenneth Copeland calling Dennis Burke to the front for ministry and he invites him to come and take the mark of the beast. What we must understand here is that if he comes out and pronounces the word clearly, a large part of the congregation would probably get up and walk out of the meeting and reject his ministry altogether. But if he says it in a disguised manner, making out as though he is speaking in tongues, then he can fool the listeners and get away with it. So we are not putting words into his mouth as the words mark of the beast are clearly pronounced. And that should be enough for a Christian to seriously consider rejecting his ministry. He is not speaking in another language here in which the words of that language sound like this phrase in English. I'll be proving this to you on the next example. So let us have a listen to it. I'll play it for you two times at normal speed and then I'll freeze the picture and play the sound of his voice at slower speeds in order to help you hear exactly what he's saying. I'll be doing this to all the examples on the video. So listen carefully now to Kenneth Copeland's voice as he's purposely speaking in a disguised manner while pretending to be speaking in tongues. And he says the words, Come, take the mark of the beast. Uh, come on, come on. Come on. Dennis, oh. Dennis Burke, come here. Oh. Mark of the beast. Bole. Kenneth, I have got a man by the distos kapana. Dengrip elo el e manga mango na. Come on, come on, come on. Dennis, oh. Dennis Burke, come here. Oh. Bob Benny Mackley, beast. Bole. Can't think. I have got a man by the distos kapana. Dengrip elo el e manga mango na. Bob Benny Mackley, beast. Oh. 
On this next one, you can hear Kenneth Copeland asking Satan to tie up the money that is coming through the movement. That is, the money that is starting to roll in out of Christian pockets from Christians that are being deceived by the supernatural demonic powers that are being displayed by these evil men in the meetings. Ignorant Christians are fooled into giving their tithes and offices for the support and furtherance of what they have been led to believe to be the work and move of the Holy Spirit. You shouldn't have any troubles hearing this one. Listen to Kenneth Copeland's voice and you'll hear him communicating with Satan as he says the words, Tie my money, Satan. Too many people watching. It's too many people just, just looking. Too many people watching. It's too many people just looking. It's too many people just looking. It's too many people just looking. Call my mind, baby. It's too many people just looking. Call my mind, baby. Too many people watching. Call my mind, baby. It's too many people just looking. If you forget about everybody else and just enter in. Let me show you an example of Rodney Howard Brown. Watch him first how he instructs the people not to pray. Now some well, of you can pray on the way home. Receive, well, receive, receive, receive. Now, now, now. No sopor de well, There it is, there it is, there, there it is. <laughs> Take that. In la mosso por el día. Oh, la pasia. Pria festa y asto. Manca luz o sol. Some of you are too busy praying. Don't pray. So we see him first begin by instructing the people not to pray. He knows that he must do this whenever he's introducing the movement for evil spirits to move upon the people. He does this very often using clever exhortations. He tells them that they can pray on the way home and that if their prayers were working, they wouldn't be coming to him for ministry. So they should just yield and stop praying. There are occasions when he does tell the people to pray, but it is always after he has released evil spirits upon them. He doesn't mind doing this because when the evil spirits have begun their work, they'll make the prayers of all these people go up to God ill-directed. Satanists know that they cannot have much success in releasing their powers when they are introducing them upon Christians who are praying, as the genuine prayer of a true Christian works as a wall of protection that blocks evil spiritual powers. This is why in his meetings, Rodney Howard Brown is unable to affect some Christians. They don't fall back because they are probably praying a prayer like, Lord, protect me if this is not of you. The sad thing is that many of these Christians who are not slain in the spirit the first time round are lured back to the front of these meetings by the work of lying spirits that speak through the mouths of those who have already had the slain in the spirit experience. Let us also hear from Hank Hanegraaff again from the Christian Research Institute teaching on the subject of manifestations. On one occasion, Rodney Howard Brown was supposedly preaching on hell and laughter just hit the whole place. The more I told people what hell was like, the more they laughed, he said. Now let me tell you something, in past revivals, Men like Jonathan Edwards drew graphic portrayals of what hell was like. In his famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, you have such a graphic portrayal of hell that you can almost feel the flames. And yes, when that message was preached, people trembled under conviction and repented if they for the Holy One of Israel. My friends, trembling and manifestations are not an end in themselves. In great revivals, they were a demonstration of repentance under the powerful proclamation of the Word of God. The difference between a counterfeit revival and the genuine article is the difference between the deeds of the Spirit and the deeds of the flesh. The deeds of the Spirit are characterized by love and joy and peace and by self-control. 
I never thought when I became a Christian in 1979 that I would live to see what's happening in the church today. I never ever envisioned having to stand in a pulpit and speak about such awful, devilish manifestations in the very sanctuary. The same manifestations I have viewed for years in the kingdom of the cults, in the world of the occult. I, I never thought I would live to see this being manifested in the church. In fact, the church is being sensitized to the world of the occult and desensitized to, to the word of God Almighty. John Wimber's response to manifestations like roaring, he says, well, I recognize that there are certain manifestations of the Spirit that have gone on in our meetings for 15 years. We supposed they were demonic in origin, and there were times in the past where we attempted to cast demons out of people who made animal noises. On some occasions, demons manifested and we did cast them out. On other occasions, we were puzzled by the lack of deliverance. Therefore, I think in the past we had a rather simplistic view of all of these things. In other words, in the past when someone would roar or bark or growl, they said, aha, that person is demon-possessed. And so they'd have a deliverance service. Now he's saying, 15 years later, I was kind of wondering why some of the time demons didn't come out. Maybe that's because this was divine after all. He goes on to say, quote, I do not personally hold the opinion that this is demonic or necessarily divine. If I put this in the category of pondering, I don't know. I am looking for, in the aftermath, the effects of the experience to see how it relates to the person's life, close quote. In other words, this makes the church a laboratory and the people guinea pigs. A far cry from a pastor protecting his sheep against wolves. Paul, the apostle, did not say, well, we're going to see how this shakes out. He said, I never stop warning each one of you night and day with tears. He said that many will, will be deceived, not by those in the kingdom of the cults, but even from among your own number, he said, men will arise, distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after themselves. Be on your guard. Satan is a master counterfeiter. He masquerades as an angel of enlightenment. He wants you to encounter him and think you're in touch with a living God. There are several ways of finding out who else is a Satanist like these men. Whenever a Christian minister speaks out against any one of the Satanists, there are others who will run to their aid and do everything they can to discredit what is being said about the Satanist. This has happened on many occasions. One of those was when Hank Hanegraaff from the Christian Research Institute began to speak out against the teachings of the faith movement, in particular the teachings of Kenneth Copeland. He was met with strong opposition by certain other men. Let me just play you this excerpt from the Christianity in Crisis audio tape where you'll hear what Paul Crouch, Kenneth Copeland and Benny Hinn had to say. Those who are feeding this, this cancer occupy some of the most powerful platforms within Christianity. They control vast resources and stand to lose multiplied millions of dollars if they are indeed exposed. The stakes are now so high that those who are plunging Christianity into crisis seem willing to do and say virtually anything to silence opposition and to rally support. And that's no empty charge. In fact, to prove that what I'm saying is true, listen to this. Heretic hunters, these guys who spend their lives straightening us all out doctrinally, they're going to go straight to hell. They're going to absolutely... I, I think they're damned and on their way to hell, and I don't think there's any redemption for them. I said, to hell with you! I say, get out of God's way! Quit blocking God's bridges, or God's going to shoot you if I don't. I refuse all right. to argue any longer with any of you out there. Right. Don't even call me if you want to argue doctrine. If you want to straighten somebody out over here, if you want to criticize Ken Coben for his preaching on faith or dad Hagen, get out of my life. I don't want to even talk to you or hear you. 
I don't want to see your ugly face. Several people that I know have criticized. Some of them are dead right today in an early grave because of it, and there's more than one of them got cancer. I don't care whether you like me or, 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 or not. Don't ever touch me. Don't ever touch Paul Crouch. Let me say something else too, and I really don't care if you like this or not. You have attacked me, your children will pay for it. I've looked for one verse in the Bible, I just can't seem to find it. One verse that said, if you don't like him, kill him. I really wish I could find it. I wish God would give me a Holy Ghost machine gun, I'll blow your head off. Whenever anyone seriously opposes these men by attacking their teachings, this is the cultish manner in which they bite back to defend themselves. Now there is also another way of finding out who else is a Satanist. There are people of whom these men continually speak well of during their preaching and recommend their listeners to learn from. Some of the people which they continually mention in their preaching are names like Kenneth Hagen, Catherine Kuhlman, Amy Semple McPherson, William Branham, T.L. Osborne, Jerry Savelle, John Avanzini, Marilyn Hickey, Robert Tilton, Paul Crouch, Frederick Price, and Morris Sorello, just to name a few. All of these people preach the same gospel. Have a listen to some of their preaching. This is the gospel that they preach. On radio and television, many faith teachers presented Jesus who looks remarkably like themselves. He is even decked out in designer clothes. <laughs> uh, well, what else are you going to call it? Now, uh, designer clothes, that's blasphemy. No, that's what we call them today. I mean, you didn't get the stuff he wore off the rack. It wasn't a one-size-fits-all deal. Uh-uh, uh-uh, no. No, this was custom stuff. According to faith teachers like Avanzini, Jesus was handling big money. Predictably, they also claim that Jesus had a nice house, a big house. And his followers are said to be incredibly wealthy. Why? Paul had the kind of money that people, <laughs> that government officials would, would block up justice to try to get a bribe out of old Paul. So committed to this theology is Avanzini that he attacks apologists and theologians who teach that Jesus was a suffering servant. In utter disgust, he says. I don't know where these goofy traditions creep in at, but one of the goofiest ones is that Jesus and his disciples were poor. Now, there's no Bible to substantiate that. Truth is, however, there is Bible to substantiate it. For example, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 says, To this very hour we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. In Philippians 3, he says, Whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. But despite this fact, Avanzini says, You can't become like him if you don't understand how he was financially. He was anything but poor. Of course, John Evanzini is not alone. Oral Roberts wrote a book entitled, How I Learned Jesus Was Not Poor. And then there's Frederick Price, who says he's trying to get you out of this malaise of thinking that Jesus and the disciples were poor, and then relating that to you, thinking that you as a child of God have to follow Jesus. The Bible says that he has left us an example that we should follow his steps. That's the reason why I drive a Rolls Royce. I'm following Jesus' steps. Jesus was handling big money. You don't think these are the apostles didn't walk around with money. I mean, they had money. I was shocked when I found out who the biggest failure in the Bible actually is. Okay. You know, everybody asks you, say, who's the biggest failure? They say, Judas. Somebody else will say, no, I believe it's Adam. Well, how about the devil? He's the most consistent failure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but he's not the biggest in terms of material failure and so forth. The biggest one in the whole Bible is God. I'm sick and tired of hearing how it used to be back 40 years ago. I got so sick of it, I said, Lord, if I hear it one more time, I'm going to throw up. I want to sick now. And I'm sick and tired of hearing about sweets of gold. I don't need gold in heaven. I got to have it now. I can have it here.
You say, well, Benny Hinn, isn't that wonderful to have gold, sweets, and glory? Well, of course, but if I hear the thing one more time of how it will be and how it was, I'm gonna kick somebody. <laughs> Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We're not worried what other people think. No, uh-huh, doesn't matter what they think. <laughs> oh, no more de esta pacalia, no. Oh, le beve de abaixo do pre. The next few examples that I'll be showing you are all from a meeting that Jesse Duplantis held in Australia. Let me begin by showing you another example of Jesse Duplantis doing this sign. Now on this one you can hear him quickly say the words, I'm with Satan, immediately after he does the sign. There are only two possible explanations for what he says here. It is either him doing this deliberately or a demon sticking out of him that says this. Watch his right hand very carefully as he does the sign and then quickly says the words, I'm with Satan. Oh, he didn't know Jehovah as Father. He was a reciter of Lauren's words. I want to tell you something. A re, a, a re, oh, he didn't know Jehovah as Father. He was a, was a reciter of Lauren's words. I want to tell you something. A re, a, a re, he was a reciter of Lauren's words. I want to tell you something. A re, a, a re, he was a reciter of Lauren's words. I want to tell you something. A re, a, a re, he was a reciter of Lauren's words. On this next one, you'll see what kind of a blasphemous spirit it is that is moving this man. As he says that when you become a son of God, you become a son that serves Satan. He's preaching from John chapter 1 and verse 12 here. After quoting some of the verse, he says that God is not interested in you being a servant, but he's interested in you being a son. But when you become a son, you become a son that serves. Just after he says that, he then pauses for a second or two, and then you can hear him say the word, Satan. None of you should have any problems hearing this, as it is very clear. So what I'll do for you is play you the whole statement, and then pause it just after he says Satan. Listen for the word Satan at the very end of what he says here. See, God's not interested in you being a servant. He's interested in you being a son. But when you become a son, you're a son that serves. See? See, God's not interested in you being a servant. He's interested in you being a son. But when you become a son, you're a son that serves. See? But when you become a son, you're a son that serves. See? He's more... But when you become a son, you're a son that serves. See? He's more... But when you become a son, you're a son that serves. See, he's more to become the sons of God. See, God's not interested in you being a servant. He's interested in you being a son. But when you become a son, you're a son that serves. See, he's more interested in getting you in the family. Once he gets you in the family, then he can get you to serve. Get 
that lady back there. <laughs> Get her too, right? <laughs> Get them both, drunk enough. Holy God. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> Who is this man here? Ben, Banjo? Hey, Banjo! <laughs> Give Ben Banjo some more. Hallelujah! <laughs> I just realized. <laughs> Get him, Lord. I just realized God's playing his banjo. <laughs> Did you hear that? God's playing his banjo. <laughs> next. Oh, you're next. Okay, come on. <laughs> Listen to what he says as the lady is manifesting. He's ministering to a young man. He starts by saying, in the name of Jesus, and then he says, my Satan's girl, referring to the lady, and then immediately after that, while ministering to the young man, he says, loose his power with us. And then he returns to using Christian language by, by saying, hallelujah. Listen to this Satanist slipping these words while pretending to be ministering the Holy Spirit to the people. The words, loose his power with us, are a little bit difficult to hear as the recording is not that good, but you still should be able to pick them up. Listen to Joe Jordan saying, my Satan's girl, loose his power with us. Everything that needs to be in the name of Jesus, my faith is done. Get the power Hallelujah. Everything that needs to be in the name of Jesus, my faith is done. Fill her, fill her. Oh. She's my secretary. She's what?
Now, there's something going on here. I, uh, I'm sure you figured that out, but Mary, Mary Audrey heads up our ministry team here. And for the last year, she's been the one saying, now we've got to, you know, not do the extreme behavior. We've got to keep a lid on this. We've got to, you know, and... It just flipped right out of his chair. <laughs> After barely 30 minutes, the church resembles a battleground. As you can see, people are quite literally dropping to the floor like flies. Whether or not you believe this is the work of God or the Holy Spirit, it is a truly bizarre sight. Many of these people will stay like this for quite a few hours yet. On this next one, you'll see Stacey Campbell, one of the leading women of the movement, get taken over by a supernatural power and start to preach a message about the love of God and the movement. She's not prophesying here. What she's doing is called channeling. Channeling is a new age term for spirit possession. This occurs when humans willingly give their minds and bodies to spirit beings. These spirits enter and control the people and use them to give spiritual teachings or other information. When spirits use the mouth and speak out information, this is called channeling. When I first saw this, it reminded me of a scene out of that movie called The Exorcist. The only difference being in this case, her head doesn't turn right around. It is very easy for a young Christian who is not grounded in the word to be fooled by the words that the spirit is speaking through her into believing that it is the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is preaching a New Age message of love. It is not the Holy Spirit that is moving this lady. Watch her head as it moves from side to side at an amazing speed. You'll need a strong stomach for this one as the evil spiritual presence that is speaking through her can be felt as you watch it. Any genuine Christian with an ounce of the Holy Spirit in them should immediately recognize that this is a foreign spirit that is speaking through her. This is Stacy Campbell. This is the better looking part between Wes and Stacy, and the, by far the more anointed. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing, but very anointed person. Uh, First, Corinthians, First Corinthians 13. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong, noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to the poor, and if I deliver my body to be burned but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there, there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. Um, and uh, uh, now abide faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. And what I felt the Lord say is that Christianity is a love story. It is a story of the love of God to man. It is a story of love between man and God. And it is a story of love 
between men and men. And then every time you see displays of God, whether they be prophecy, it is God speaking to man out of his love because he loves the people that he has created. Whether it be tongues, it is the love of God, because the love of man going up to his God, not even touching his understanding, but the Spirit speaking to the Spirit in this language of love. And whether it be mercy, giving everything you have to the poor, it is a story of love between men and men. And that all displays of God, when he comes that down from heaven and dies on the cross is a story of his love for his people. And when he comes down from heaven and touches people with his power, the Lord says, look beyond the power. Look beyond the shaking. Look beyond the weeping. Look beyond the laughter and see that I'm healing my people. I am touching my people. I am delivering my people from bondages. I am setting captives free. And I am loving my people. And when I love them, and when I touch them, and when I set them free, they will go out and love each other. And know that this is the test of this revival as it happens in your hearts. Do you love me? each other. I feel like the Lord said also that this movement of his spirit truly be a test of love. Do you love me more than the pull of religion to drag you back into an empty letter that kills and destroys and attacks out viciously? more than your father and your mother do you love me more than family ties and will you push out and will you push on to follow me with all your heart soul strength and mind or will you stop at the door looking in? And also, do you love me enough to forgive those who persecute you? To pray for those who speak evil of you? And to do good to those who hurt you and despitefully use you? Christianity is a love story. The love of God to man. The love of man to God. And the love of man to man. Just, just for some of you, just an assurance, this is not self-indulgence. This is the Lord. And we need this to go out and to do the things God's calling us to do. To reach the poor and the oppressed. This is not self-indulgence. you need? You need a Holy Ghost enema right up your rear end. You know what? If your engine is not revving up, 
You know what you need? You need a Holy Ghost enema right up your rear end. What's about to happen to you happened on the day of Pentecost. You want it? For sure now. Lord Jesus, thank you. Here, guys, take it. Ooh. <laughs> After waving his hand over the children and causing them to receive the laughter, Benny Hinn began to speak about how glorious the presence was that was causing the laughter in the children. Immediately after he says that, you could hear him say the words, Lord Jesus, give them sin, holy laughter to the people, I pray. When he says the words, give them sin, he says them very quickly, so you'll have to listen very carefully for it. You'll hear it clearly when I slow it down for you. Listen to him quickly say the words, Lord Jesus, give them sin, holy laughter to the people, I pray. Lord Jesus, give them sin, holy laughter to the people, I pray. Lord Jesus, give that same holy laughter to the people, I pray. Lord Jesus, give that same holy laughter to the people, I pray. Lord Jesus, give that same holy laughter to the people, I pray. Lord Jesus, give that same holy laughter to the people, I pray. Yeah, it's happening again down here. It's happening again down here. Here it goes. Look at them. Look at those kids. Leave, leave it. Just leave it. Just look at them laughing. This is glory. Lord Jesus, give that same holy laughter to the people. I pray. That is beautiful on these kids. Any more kids down here? Get up here quickly. There's one more example that I just found of Benny Hinn that I'd like to show you. This is from his program, This Is Your Day. He is a Satanist, Benny Hinn and Paul Crouch are saying that this baby's leg was deformed and got healed during the meeting. Benny Hinn has the microphone placed at Paul Crouch's mouth. As Paul Crouch is holding the baby, 
and tells the cameraman to give him a close-up of the baby's legs, you can hear Benny Hinn saying a few words that the microphone picks up. You can hear him quickly say the words, that's glory, Satan. He probably thinks that his voice won't be heard being a fair distance away from the microphone. Listen carefully for this and you'll pick it up. Listen for Benny Hinn's voice and you'll hear him say, that's glory, Satan. That's glory, Satan. That's glory, Satan. Oh, shit. That's glorious, isn't it? That's glorious, isn't it? That's glorious, isn't it? That water. I want to clean the little, clean the little thing here. Manny, look here. Give me a close-up. That's glorious, isn't it? Oh, she's beautiful. You know what? If your engine is not revving up, you know what you need? You need a Holy Ghost enema right up your rear end. It has been my job on this video to present the evidence to you. What you do in response to the truth and the action that you take in the light of the knowledge that you now have about these men and this movement is something which God will hold each one of us accountable for. If you are a genuine Christian and have been caught up in this movement, if the Holy Spirit really dwells in you, then you should have already done what God expects you to do. Nothing less than a total renunciation of all of your involvement with the movement can be acceptable. You must not only confess your association with this movement as sin, but also repent by taking a firm stand against the movement, openly confessing with your mouth that this is not of God. To remain neutral is to remain in a state of sin. A positive choice for truth must be made for God's forgiveness, favour and blessing to be experienced. My prayer for you is that you will be led by the, by the grace of God to do the right thing. May God bless you and I thank you for the opportunity for allowing me to share these things with you. I look forward to your company on part two of evidence and video clips that will shock you, the Toronto Blessing Unmasked.